All right, hey everybody, it's Mr. Harvey here, dropping you another YouTube uh, online lecture, and we're gonna be talking about the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution is um, is a monumental event, absolutely will show up on your AP test somewhere, and is something that you need to know. Now, the Industrial Revolution is, um, we're gonna see the application of science being, you know, um, used in the economy. We're going to see people applying new ideas to machines. We're going to see the new, uh, these new machines, new, uh, new sources of fuel, new industries are just going to absolutely transform Europe. And it's all starting in Protestant Great Britain. Okay. Uh, uh, right before the industrial revolution, we talked about the agricultural revolution. Uh, we talked about the, the putting out system, the cottage industry. Uh, all these factors are going to help facilitate the Industrial Revolution. So let's jump right in and here we go. Okay, uh, the Industrial Revolution, all right? Starting in the late 1700s in uh, Great Britain, okay? And and it's been, ha it's, it's not like it just started. Like on October 31st of 1750, the Industrial, no, man, that's not, that's not what went down. Uh, what went down is we start to see um, with the ag with the, the agricultural revolution that's going on with uh, uh, the putting out system and textiles uh, and the cottage industry going on. We're going to see these factors are going to uh, you know lead to uh, the industrialization of the first industry, which is textiles. Okay, um, just giving you a little macro knowledge and some background general knowledge about the Industrial Revolution. This is going to be a time of, you know, unbelievable economic growth. Um, the world will never be the same. We're going to see during this time uh, new machines, transportation, the train, the car. Um, we're going to see industrialized weapons, machine guns, tanks. Uh, we're going to see more people, uh, we're going to see a new working class. You know, there's no longer a lot of peasant farmers. They're going to be the working class factory workers. Uh, we're going to see, uh, uh, children go into the workforce and then that, that's later going to be rescinded. Um, this is a time where we see tons and tons of changes socially, economically, politically. Okay. Um, we're going to see, uh, a great production of goods and services, but there is going to be a high social cost. Um, we'll see a lot of poverty. Um, the industrialization, some historians say that, you know, industrialization helped get rid of, you know, rural poverty. Um, but I would argue that we will, we will see, you know, a lot of urban poverty caused by the industrial uh, revolution. Um, so we'll see some poverty go away, but we'll see other sources of poverty created, mainly in the cities. You know, we'll start seeing some homeless people, you know, without a job. Um, and these homeless people in cities, you know, kind of wandering the streets. Um, the Industrial Revolution is going to make people in Europe and in the world consumers. Think about all the things that you and your family have bought today or maybe bought in the past week or what did you what what did people buy on black friday um people are going to learn to want things i can relate to that because man oh my gosh i want the new ps4 or dude i need a new surfboard or dude i want the new pair of vans i need a new skateboard or, you know i want a, a new i need a new computer i got a new computer i need that new macbook people are gonna learn to want things. And you all know it's true. Man, the new iPhone 10 come out. You know, I need that. All oh, the new Samsung Galaxy came out. I need that. The production of new goods is going to be driven by demand. And the demand is coming from people. People are gonna want goods and services. Um, examples, people are gonna want, oh my God, I want those new jeans that have holes in them. I don't understand that personally, but whatever. I'm not going to judge. Uh, toys, furniture, rugs, you know, uh, jewelry, watches. People are going to want exotic foods. Oh my God, I want a, I want a, a burger from Red Robin tonight. Or man, I want the, uh, you know, I want to go to, uh, I don't know, 
a famous restaurant, you know, and get some food. I want a burrito from this place. Uh, people are going to want, you know, want things. Um, and that's going to be, uh, and that's going to be, uh, an effect of this, um, industrial revolution, this consumer ideology, consumerism. Uh, a couple of other implications. We're going to see, uh, people starting to uh, have a disposable income during this time of where they can buy things, okay? Uh, industrial, industrialization does not work without people having enough disposable income to be consumers and buy stuff. I'm not going to buy a new pair of Vans if I can't buy food first, if I don't have any extra money to be able to afford it. People aren't going to be able to buy a new car. People you know, aren't going to be able to buy... Uh, a rug, buy a new pair of shoes if they don't have disposable income. It doesn't work like that. Um, during this time, during the industrialization, we're going to start seeing marketing. Okay, think about the importance of marketing. You know, in our culture today, you know, Red Robin, yum, right? Ba da ba ba ba. Okay, I want my beer back, beer back, beer back, beer back, beer back. I want my beer back, beer back, beer back, beer back, beer back. Right? Marketing. It's it's super relevant. Um. Uh, and uh, we're gonna see the earliest type of marketing, earliest types of marketing, with in the industrial revolution, and then we're gonna see it in, within uh, woven in with that print culture. We're gonna see advertisements in newspapers. Uh, we're gonna see them in magazines, uh, journals. Uh, we're gonna see advertisements. Okay, we're gonna see with uh, textiles. Textiles in Great Britain is gonna be the first, the making of clothing. That's gonna be the first industry to industrialize, and we're going to see um, the development of a uh, fashion industry gotta get the latest trends man um and this consumer economy is going to be a permanent feature of the european economy and eventually the world economy um you know we are consumers out here in the west okay and that does conflict with christian ethics you know ideas such as greed okay it definitely con conflicts with some uh christian ideologies all right uh, a little picture of uh of uh some dresses that are getting ready to be sold so pretty well it looks like very wealthy extravagant dresses and you know the upper class uh you know probably uh upper class women uh wanting to buy these dresses okay all right great britain let's talk about why it starts in great britain and great britain is going to be the industrial leader in europe through the 1800s eventually they're gonna get caught by ding 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 Germany in the second the second phase of the Industrial Revolution it's gonna be all Germany okay and Germany is going to become a powerhouse economically okay there's no coincidence that they're gonna have some uh, some serious hardware some serious steel um, in Germany some serious weapons in Germany uh, because Germany is gonna completely industrialize the Asian power that's uh, in Asia that's going to industrialize in the second part of the uh, 19th century will be Japan, okay? And then the United States uh, will industrialize as well. But the first country, the first country that starts uh, industrialization will be Great Britain. Why, okay? Um, this is very important to know and I'm gonna need you uh, all to know this, okay? I want you all to memorize these reasons. They're important. Land and geography. Great Britain is an island off the coast of Europe. When all these wars go down, Great Britain's involved in them, but their country is not being utterly destroyed, like France. France is going to be jacked up from the French Revolution. Prussia, jacked up during the Seven Years' War. Okay, Russia is going to get jacked up during the Napoleonic Wars. Europe, continental Europe, is going to be jacked up. Not Great Britain, though. You have to cross the Channel in order to get them, and they've got their beautiful, big navy that is protecting them, they are going to be spared from the wars, okay? Great Britain also had a lot of natural resources, iron and coal. Iron and coal are going to be two fundamental resources of the first phase of the industrialization. Coal is going to be the material used to power the machines, uh, predominantly uh, the steam engine. Iron is going to be the material to make the machines. Later on in the second phase, we're going to see these two resources the two important resources shift to steel and oil for the internal combustion engine. Uh, waterways. Great Britain is an island. It has a lot of water. Okay, Water is good for 
early power with the water wheel before the steam engine and uh, easy transportation of goods. You can literally put a, a, a barge or a boat, you can just send it down river with a whole bunch of goods and it's free and cheap way to transport goods. And we're gonna talk about, uh, and I'll talk about my lecture tomorrow on Friday, uh, a little bit about canals. Canals are like are artificially made waterways that kind of stem from, you basically make a giant cut into a river and uh, you uh, drain the water and you create an artificial waterway. It's kind of gnar. Agricultural revolution in Great Britain, huge cause, okay? You are now gonna have a supply of cheap labor that came from all of those farmers. All those farmers are now, uh, they, have no, they have no jobs, um, they're unemployed, and they're moving to the cities and towns to find new work. They are willing to work for cheap wages, and there's a lot of them. Uh, more people are gonna be fed with less farmers, okay? So the farmers are gonna seek work in other places, but if you have more food, you're gonna have more people, AKA you're gonna have a much bigger labor force. So Great Britain is gonna have a army of laborers ready to work in the factories, and that is gonna help them. Uh, Great Britain also had a lot of cash money, all right? Where'd they get all this money from? They got it from their rich empire, okay? They got it from their colonial uh, trading empire. And, and so they have all this money. They're gonna be able to spend this money and invest in new ideas and they're gonna be able to invest in new technology. They are wealthy, so they will be able to invest uh, and help put some money behind these new ideas and help uh, create with their money and capital new um, uh, new machines and new technology, okay? Uh, Great Britain also had a large supply of entrepreneurs, all right? Uh, we see these are people who are very uh, very inventive, highly motivated, who uh, who are willing to take risks. And if, if you want any uh, like contemporary examples of entrepreneurs, think about like people like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg. Steve Jobs was like, oh, hey, check this out. I got this idea. I'm going to make uh, a phone and then uh, here's a computer. And I'll put them together. Boom. iPhone. Millions. Bang. All right. Unreal. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. Hey, how about like I create this thing of where like I put a profile on the internet and, you know, you, everybody else does it. We can like talk to each other all the time. Facebook. Okay. A new idea, um, taking risks, and uh, and we see a lot of people like this who are going to be taking risks, coming up with new ideas, and they're going to um, invest in them. All right, um, and a lot of entrepreneurs in England were influenced by that Protestant work ethic and that Calvinist idea of working hard. Uh, um, you know that if they if they made money uh, and they lived uh, the right way that. This was a way of God rewarding them, okay? And so very, we're gonna see a lot of people, highly motivated, highly hardworking people, motivated by that Protestant work ethic. Uh, they're gonna uh, come out with a series of inventions and make money and therefore believe like, oh look, you know, I'm part of the elect, I'm, you know, I'm successful. And we're gonna see a lot of that in Great Britain. Um, their colonial empire gave them a lot of raw materials, okay? Remember mercantilism, but we're gonna see Great Britain go away from mercantilism during this time. Great Britain got uh, a lot of had a, a large source of raw materials coming in from their colonies, and in uh, in uh, they also had a large market to sell you know new new goods and uh, to sell their uh, manufactured goods. So it uh, with their colonial empire, that was a ripe opportunity for Great Britain to um, get the raw materials it needed and sell them and sell the manufactured goods. The government. The government is going to be very sympathetic to industrial development and the government is going to start limiting mercantilism. What's that called? That's capitalism. Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, England. England is, Great Britain is going to start uh, using that new idea. They're Protestant, remember? New ideas. They're going to start using that new idea of capitalism. They're going to repeal the Navigation Acts that uh, restricted colonial trade. Um, they're going to uh, uh, allow for the creation of joint stock companies. Um, and parliamentary le legislation was favorable to um, industrialization. Now, really quickly with the joint stock company, and I'm just going to really talk about what stock is. Um, these are companies that want investors. And so a joint stock company is, is in summary, okay, and this is kind of a loose definition. Uh, it's where you have people 
have like a company. So say for example, I have the Mr. Harvey company of space exploration for mining minerals. Okay. And I'm going to, I have this idea that I'm going to go to Mars and mine it for rare minerals. Okay. Uh, say for example, a couple people, uh, give me a million dollars that means, and they invest in my company and they buy stock. Okay. They buy a part of my company. Okay. That person who is investing in my company uh, now owns part of the company. Okay, I own a part, but they also own a part too because they've invested it and they've bought they bought shares or stock. Therefore, if I start making a lot of money, the people who invested start making a lot of money. If I don't make any money and I lose money, they lose money as well. So it's a risk, but it's it's allowing for entrepreneurs, it's allowing for business, and uh, the Great Britain during this time is going to start. The government is going to let go, get out of the way, and we're going to see them let the businessmen, the natural laws of economics take hold, and then we are going to see them um, let businessmen kind of dictate the economy, and that is capitalism. Um, and a stable government, like I said, okay, not devastated during the wars, unlike uh, France during the French Revolution and Germany during the Continental Wars, okay? Textile production. The Industrial Revolution is going to begin with the clothing industry. It begins with textiles, okay? And the earliest, remember, the earliest industrial change is going to take place in the countryside with that putting out system, not in cities, okay? And we are going to see with textiles, with England making a ton of new clothes and industrializing in the textile industry, there's going to be a large demand of cotton. Where are they going to get that cotton from? The United States. Okay, we've kind of already talked about this. We're, we see the very precursor, pre-industrialization with that uh, putting out system of where we see a uh, uh, merchants go into the countryside, send uh, you know a raw material, wool uh, cloth to the peasants who spin it and weave it into cloth where the merchants then go on and sell it. Okay, um, There was a big demand for clothes and supply could not meet, meet demand. Okay, Supply could not meet the demand. So what do we do? We see inventions to increase the supply to meet the demand. Okay? A um, couple really important inventions. The spinning jenny. This allows for there to be more thread. If there's more thread, you can. Uh, if there's uh, more thread, you can therefore uh, weave more shirts. Okay. The the water frame. Okay. This uh, this was a water power device that produced uh, cotton fabric, um, and this will take cotton production out of the home and into the factory. The water frame will allow for a uh, uh, textiles to be created uh, but in like a factory type setting that is powered by water, the movement of a water wheel. And then eventually the steam engine. Now I have a pet peeve and my students from AP or last year would let you know this, okay? James Watt, and I don't know who invented the steam engine, okay? They're irrelevant, right? James Watt will perfect it. He will make it more efficient, okay? And now you have a revolutionary type of device that doesn't get tired. Think about it. The steam engine, uh, the steam engine does not get tired. It can work for 24 hours straight as long as you give it coal and energy. Okay, revolutionary invention, and this was considered the key to the industrial revolution. The steam engine. Later on in the second part of the industrial revolution, we're going to see the engine that we all, all have in our cars today, well, for the most part, except for Tesla and jets. They have a turbine, um, a turbine, but um the internal combustion engine. Huge, okay? But these, uh, the spinning jenny, uh, the water frame, we're going to see some inventions that are going to be crucial to the textile industry that will allow uh, supply to meet demand. And it's going to literally, uh, it's going to literally create new levels of production never seen before. You're going you're to have machines that can do the job of what 20 humans did in a matter of minutes, okay? These machines could produce way more than just humans. Okay, um, the results of the new technology for the textile industry, you know, by, uh, by, uh, 1800, you know, by the 17, late 1700s, you're seeing these new machines produce way more cotton yarn, way more textiles than they could. Um, Great Britain, uh, is going to produce by 1850, more than one half of all the world's cloth. What? A little island being able to do that? Well, that's machinery. Okay, so Great Britain 
uh, is going to be, you know, way far and ahead, and they're going to be able to produce a lot more with their new technology. Okay, uh, cotton, there's going to be such a big supply because Great Britain is able to produce so much that cotton will be so cheap, shirts, clothes, linens, so cheap that all classes could enjoy them. Okay, and uh, I think that is a picture of the spinning Jenny. That is a, a device that, let me make sure real quickly. I'm not too sure. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it's the spinning Jenny. Okay. But um, this uh, this was a device that um, could spin thread. And you can see all the little spindles, all the little threads being spun. Okay. So it could spin um, thread much more quickly than... Um, than one than just one human okay the steam engine and coal this was um this is big time okay this was big time james watt scottish okay um he will perfect that steam engine okay and this was a device that could produce unlimited power okay all you need to do was give it uh, was uh give it coal and that thing would just keep going and going and going and going Okay, uh, it was portable, right? You could just literally move the engine somewhere, and we're gonna see uh, we're gonna see entrepreneurs, factory owners, put an engine in their factory, and it's gonna go. And it's not, you know, it would work in rain. There's no, you know, the the predominant pre the big sources of energy pre industrial revolution were like wind um, and horsepower. Um, you know, don't need to feed this thing, and if it's you know not windy you can still get power um this was not dependent upon nature you just need to give it coal and coal is going to revolutionize industry now this um this is a really important facet of the industrial revolution uh, indu gosh i can't talk sometimes the industrial revolution um with new inventions you're going to see the need for other industries to industrialize let me give you an example with the advent of the steam engine, now you need a lot of coal. So we're gonna see that industry kind of boom. With the advent of the steam engine, you're gonna see the need for iron now. So the industrial revolution kind of grows on top of itself. With, with the invention of one thing, now another industry opens up and then another separate industry is gonna open up. So with the advent of the steam engine, now you're going to see the energy industry rise up with coal. Then you're going to see the iron industry rise up with, with coal and with the steam engine. You see how they're all related? Okay. That is a really important, um, is going to be a really important part of the um, industrial revolution. Uh, coal is going to be uh, used to power the steam engine and coal will also uh, be used to help produce uh, iron and smelt it. Um, and the way that you get iron, and I'm not, you know, a, a metallurgist and I'm not uh, an authority on uh, metal, but basically what you do is you get raw iron ore from the earth and you heat it up and you're able to take the pig iron, you're able to take the iron, separate the iron from the rock and get the, uh, the actual element and then, you know, heat it up, mold it and shape it into whatever you want, whatever material and whatever shape that you want. Um, that's, you know, but you need coal in order to do that in order to smelt it. So you can see how, remember how the industries are related and kind of building upon each other. Okay. Uh, by 1850, England produces 66.66666, uh, percent of the world's coal, two thirds of the world's coal. All right. And so England is going to be the economic giant, but up to a point, Germany is coming. All right. And the U S all right. Iron production. Okay. This is the chief element of all heavy industry in the first part. We're going to see both, eventually, both coal and iron uh, are going to be supplanted by uh, oil and steel, okay, uh, in, the late, in, the, uh, in the late 1850s and 1900s. It's going to no longer be uh, iron and coal, but uh, it's going to be oil and steel. Um Iron is going to be used to manufacture the machinery and materials made in the production of goods. We're going to stop seeing uh, wooden boats. We're going to start seeing steam boats. We're going to stop uh, seeing uh, you know, horse-drawn carriages. We're going to start seeing trains, train tracks. Okay, so they're going to 
iron is going to be the material that defines the um, the uh, early industrial revolution. Um, uh, we do see uh, some production limitations in the early um, uh, 18th century. Charcoal rather than uh, coke, that's a different type of, um, of uh, coal, is going to be used to smelt ore and help produce iron. Before the steam engine, furnaces couldn't achieve a high enough blast to... Uh, to produce iron so you couldn't get with before the steam engine you couldn't get enough energy uh, and uh, heat uh, to uh, to really separate um, and produce iron okay so and there was so a limited demand of iron this is pre pre uh, industrialization okay but um, but uh, when we see uh, when we see the steam engine they're going to, that's going to allow Europe to start, um, smelting the iron and that's going to allow them to get enough heat to, on a mass scale, separate that iron from the, um, from the ore. Okay. Here we go. And by 1850, uh, uh, Great Britain is going to produce two thirds of the world's, um, coal, one half of the world's iron, one half of the world's cotton. Um, their G, uh, GNP, that's their gross national product, very similar to a GDP, uh, rose between 350%. Okay, their economy was going, uh, growing, excuse me, faster than their population. Um, and their income grew as a demand for labor grew. So they were making money and they were really. Uh, pretty much ruling the world economically. Okay, we'll stop there with that video, and I am going to um, I am going to uh, post this right now.